Hello and welcome to Late Agenda. I'm Helen Daly. The Catholic Church is tonight celebrating the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, which refers to the dogma that the Blessed Virgin Mary was free from original sin from the moment of her conception. Last night, we had a secular feast, the Immaculate Apprehension of Julian Assange in London, who, according to his lawyers, is free from crime, both in his role as the WikiLeaks founder or in allegations of sexual assault in Sweden. His supporters have paid homage to Assange, who is now in Her Majesty's Wandsworth prison, the largest in Britain. This is a man who's made some very serious enemies for the very best of reasons. Uh, and has done a job of extraordinary journalist, journalism on behalf of all of us. That's the point about Julian Assange. He has served the cause of justice and democracy. I'm not here to make any kind of um, judgment on Julian Assange as an individual because I don't know him and I've never met him. Um, I'm here because I believe this is about the principles of the universal right of freedom of information and our right to be told the truth. And back home, the Foreign Minister confirmed Australia is providing consular assistance to Julian Assange. But the WikiLeaks founder isn't Mr Rudd's favourite Queenslander right now, after Assange's website released more leaked cables, providing a brutal assessment by the Americans of his time as Prime Minister. The documents from the US Embassy in Canberra and the former US Ambassador describe Mr Rudd as an abrasive, impulsive control freak. The Foreign Minister, who's already suffered the slings and arrows of domestic backstabbing, insisted he wasn't offended. And so I don't, uh, frankly, give a damn about this sort of thing. You just get on with it. I mean, are we waiting for a diplomatic cable which says Kevin Rudd is a you know, witty, charming, relaxed, down-home sort of guy who um, is constantly cracking jokes and does everything we want him to, want him to do? Well, of course not. Um, things are of a different, uh, different type when it comes to diplomatic reporting. So, frankly, mate, it's water off a duck's back. These things get said all the time. But as I said, these are general remarks about the general nature of diplomatic reporting. We don't go to the detail of any particular uh, purported um, claim in a purported cable. And Julia Gillard agreed with Kevin Rudd's assessment. The Prime Minister had only praise for the job her Foreign Minister was doing. Kevin Rudd is doing a fantastic job as Foreign Minister. Uh, Kevin Rudd is a man who throughout his adult life uh, has uh, devoted himself to expertise in foreign policy. He's bringing that expertise to bear for the Australian nation and doing an absolutely first class job. Unless you've just flown in from another planet, you will have noticed that celebrity host Oprah Winfrey has arrived in Australia, along with 300 guests and a myriad of staff and TV crews. It's quite a phenomenon, and we were wondering who we could talk to about it and what does it all mean. Then we found the perfect guest, a lecturer in American history at the US Studies Centre at Sydney University, who's writing a book called American Redemption, Sex, Rock and Religion, 1968 to 1983. As well as a historian, Dr Rebecca Sheehan is an expert in rock music and boxing in Australia and the Philippines, and she joins us now. Dr Hi. Sheehan, thanks very much for joining thanks us. Thanks for having me. Now, the controversy surrounding WikiLeaks, let's talk about that first before we get to Ms Winfrey. Uh, the leaking of sensitive documents out of the US. Now, lots of governments have become embroiled in this, including our own. But do you think it, it's led some people to call the founder and the WikiLeaks site itself, you know, as if they're the, the subversive devil incarnate who's out to endanger lives, whereas other people see him and the site as the patron saint of freedom of information? Where do you think we WikiLeaks sits in that vast spectrum? I have to say that I, I see it as being both things potentially. Uh, I'm concerned That's about... It's sitting on the fence. <laughs> it is sitting on the fence. I'm concerned about the compromised diplomacy and my initial concerns when the leaks came out were about people's safety. As it's been demonstrated that uh, agents in the field and so on haven't been compromised and names have been removed from documents that have been published, 
uh, I felt better about that. But uh, I do think that it's important to have freedom of the press. As a historian as well, I'm interested in documents, so we wouldn't be able to write histories without access to this kind of information. But I am concerned about the compromised diplomacy and some of the issues that could come up there. All right, just set it in, in a little bit of context, if you can. Uh, I know Malcolm Turnbull here in Australia has written that um, he hasn't really seen much like it, apart from Daniel Ellsberg's disclosure of the Pentagon Papers all those years ago in the United States. Do you see it in a context like that, that it is a bit unprecedented, apart from a big issue like the Pentagon Papers? Yes, I think it is unprecedented. The Pentagon Papers is different in the sense that there are specific issues that are going on there, and this is a context where I don't think the US government has been particularly under fire for issues related to foreign policy in the same way that the Nixon administration were under scrutiny and the way the Pentagon Papers affected that. Well, I guess the first lot, of, or one of the drops, was about the uh, the killing of civilians in, in Iraq, right. and so that would, would lead to a similar thing. Do you think it is the job of journalists to get out the information, get the documents out? You said as a historian you're interested, obviously, in the access to documents, but to release, try and release sensitive documents that governments don't want the public to see? Yes. I think it is the job of journalists to do that, and I am glad that it happens. I do also have concern for people's safety, though. So if safety can be... Uh, if people can be looked after in some ways or that can be kept in mind, uh, that, that would be my concern there. A couple of people have said it's very one-sided, and I guess because WikiLeaks is very dependent on leakers, and obviously the leaks have come out of the State Department and out of the US administration, uh, so we are not getting or seeing any sensitive, um, you know, the assessments of, of, say, the other side, of, for instance, of what Iran thinks of, of America and its allies, what China thinks, for example. Is that possible that we can get any balance, or is it totally up to whether there are leakers um, able to give the WikiLeaks access to documents in those other regimes? Well, I think balance of this kind would be based on leaked documents. So, because the responses that China and Iran have had are careful, calculated responses, so you just don't get the same kind of information or insight unless, it's, unless they're documents that were private to begin with. In your view, and looking back at the, I guess, the, the history of, you know, freedom of information and, and freedom of speech, particularly in the United States, should WikiLeaks or the founder, Julian Assange, be stopped? Uh, he's obviously been arrested uh, in London at, as we speak, arrested on, on um, sexual assault charges. But Sarah Palin in the United States, uh, Republican, for one, has been calling for him to be hunted down and killed. Uh, is this extremism? I think that's extremism. I think, although I feel uncomfortable about aspects of the WikiLeaks, I don't think that, uh, that WikiLeaks should be stopped. I think it serves an important function. Sarah Palin's response to most things is extreme, so I think that this is another example of, of her... Uh, giving an extreme response. Well, now that we're speaking of her, that leads me to uh, move on to another issue. I just want to ask you about, you know, Sarah Palin and, and the women of the Tea Party in particular and their place in the political landscape in, in the United States at the moment. She seems to be very much mobilising moms, as she, as she calls them. Um, is, there, is this a new conservative women's movement? I think that we'd have to be careful about calling the people who are interested in Sarah Palin a, a women's movement because there are women and men involved. There have been some surveys. I think that there was an estimate there were about 55% of the women involved in the Tea Party, or 55% of people were women, uh, but there are also concerns that those estimates aren't correct. So I think there are certainly women involved and certainly Sarah Palin has managed to mobilise women. One of the attractions of the Tea Party for women is that 
w some of the women involved seem to feel able to be involved in a way that they're not able to be in the traditional political parties in the United States, the Democrats and Republicans. Could that also mean that they don't feel a part of the feminist movement? They Absolutely. feel that's perhaps too progressive for them and, and they've been excluded from that. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that Sarah Palin's been very successful at is tapping into sort of negativity against the second wave feminism of the 1970s, which was largely cast as an anti-mothering movement. So that Sarah Palin is interested in female empowerment, I think, but at the same time she's interested in women finding power from their roles as mothers and within families, and that's what she talks about a lot. Now that's not necessarily at odds with the uh, goals of second wave feminism, but certainly I think for many people in the public they think that those two things are at odds. So by defining themselves as moms, in uh, the, the Tea Party, these women are able to have access to a new kind of female empowerment. And do you think they, it will go a long way, or do you think it will peter out before the next presidential elections? I don't think it will peter out before the next presidential elections because I think that there's a gap that's being filled by the Tea Party and by Sarah Palin that no one else is addressing. I think that she's particularly successful at appealing to people who feel disenfranchised and who are concerned about issues related to family and big government. And also I think she has a way of talking to people that establishes a kind of personal relationship. Just very briefly about Oprah Winfrey's visit, you know, there's a lot, there are a lot of people who are really interested in this. What do you think it is about her that has made her into a media and a cultural icon, perhaps more than a political um, a person of influence, even though she, she did campaign for Barack Obama? I think a Oprah is simultaneously a shapeshifter and someone who is always herself. So over the years she's managed to reinvent herself. Even literally she has shifted shape with her very public battle with weight. But at the same time she is always and always becoming Oprah. The brand Oprah has become stronger and stronger. And but, I, but I mean lots of people have brands. How has she been able to make herself into a brand and what is her appeal? Do you think? I think there are a couple of key parts. One of them is the idea of a self-made woman, the rags to riches story that she embodies. I think she's also managed to really harness the idea of taking the personal public. So making uh, what's important and what's discussed often in private something that's important and acceptable in the public sphere. And I think that's one of the reasons that she's attractive to Australians. It's not really part of Australian culture, therapy culture, in the same way that we think of the United States as being related to people being in therapy and talking about their problems. So I think that Oprah has the appeal of being from the United States and allowing people to engage with these personal issues that are important to them. Do you think she really has affected mainstream uh, life in the United States, if not other Western countries? Yes. I, I think that she's affected the way that people think about talking about themselves. I right, think so that therapeutic sort of value that she has in, you know, come and sit on the couch and tell me about yourself and let's all be in this conversation together. Right, absolutely. And I also think that she's a part of a culture that focuses on individual improvement rather than looking at and criticising the social structure and social problems. So that I think that's appealing to some people on the one hand, but on the other hand it kind of distracts from the real issues there are in the United States. So in a sense you're saying she, she's not saying that governments will solve everything. She wants you to come and sit on the couch and she'll help you solve your own problems? Is Absolutely. And also help, encourage us to work towards solving problems for ourselves, solving our our own problems ourselves. It's a fascinating phenomenon. We'll leave it there. Dr. Rebecca Sheehan, thanks very much for talking to us. Thanks very much.